Hi, family. Hey. How we doing? Um, hey, guys, don't worry. Um, we're working with Andrew to develop a little personality. Um, <laughs> again, this service happened last service too. Somebody came up to me and like, "Hey, I mean, you know, he's, you may not have a job." <laughs> so we're gonna fire him. No, I'm just joking. He's <laughs> just joking. That, he's awesome. I love Andrew and Kylie and what they're doing with our youth group. It's awesome. So uh, we got a few miles to go before the sun sets today. Are you guys ready to go to work? Okay, so we're going to tackle the back half of Acts chapter 20 all the way through the first verse of chapter 21 because I don't think that they broke it correctly um, again. But um, we're going to wrestle with this question, like when you die, here's the thing, 100% chance that you're going to die. The, I, I used to have a, a sixth grade teacher, um, best four years of my life. Um, he, used to, he used to say, uh, there's only two things certain in this world, t- death and taxes. Um, and uh, if you heard that saying, you're going to die. Like maybe not today, uh, but you're going to die. And when you die... What do you want to be said of you? Like when people sit around a table and they uh, unofficially eulogize you, like what do you want to be said of you? So we're going to wrestle with that today because that's where Paul's at in this passage. Um, Let's begin in chapter 20, verse 15. It says, The next day we set sail from there and arrived off Chios, The day after that, we crossed over to Samus, and on the following day, we arrived at Miletus. Um, If you're coming with me to Turkey, we leave tomorrow. Um, About this time next week, we'll be in Miletus. No big deal. You should have come. Paul decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia. Now, that's a weird question, statement, so we've got to figure out why. For he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. So here, let's set the context here, what's going on. So what we know about this at this point is Paul is in his third missionary journey. And he's coming to the end of it, and he's trying to get to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. And that's a good Jewish thing to do. Um, the, there's three high holy days in the Jewish calendar that if you're going to celebrate them correctly, you have to celebrate them in Jerusalem. One is Passover, one is Sukkot, and the other one is Pentecost. And so God is, or Paul is trying to get to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost properly. Um, so he doesn't want to stop in Ephesus. Now, he can't, he can't go all the way. He's got to stop somewhere in there. Miletus and Ephesus are 50 miles away, 50 miles apart. So why does, why does he skip Ephesus? Well, what we know is Paul spent three years in Ephesus with the people there. He was serving like he knows, he knows these people and they know him. And it's hard because he knows that if he goes into Ephesus, he's not going to make it to Jerusalem in time. He knows that. I'll give you an example. So this last, a week ago, uh, last Sunday, we um, got to celebrate the marriage of our son to uh, our new daughter. Um, And it was great, but it was in the town that we came from to here. And we were there 12 years. And it's, it was, it's hard when you go back, like who do you see and who do you not see? And, and who's going to be hurt and, who's, and who do you don't care if they're hurt? Like you have to pick that because you don't have time, right? Because you don't have time to see everybody. You've been in this position before where you're like, I don't, I don't know what to do with all of that. I just know that... Um, 
uh, I got to figure out like how to, like who's the ones that I have to see and who are the ones that I don't. But it's, it's hard to know because you can't see everybody. So you got to pick and choose, but it's, it's difficult. This is, this, this is the position that Paul's in. If he goes to Ephesus, it's going to be really, really difficult for him. To, to spend time seeing all the people or not see anybody and run the risk of offending someone. And so what he does is he avoids that conversation entirely and he goes to Miletus, which is 50 miles away, and he sends for the Ephesian elders. So what he does is he gets a runner and says, go gather the Ephesian elders. Now here's the thing to think about. I don't know how long it takes to run 50 miles I've never done it. But let's say the guy is a super awesome, amazing runner, marathoner. And he makes it in a day. Let's say that he makes it in a day. And then he has to spend time in Ephesus gathering the elders and getting them uh, to be able to make preparations. So let's say he does that expediently. Ephesus is 250,000 people in the first century. It's a lot of folks. So it's going to take time for him. It's a big city. It's going to take time for him to move around and make contact. And then they got to make provisions and prepare for the journey. On and on it goes. So let's say they're two days in Ephesus. And then he's got a group of people, so he's not going to come back nearly as quickly as he went. So let's say it takes him two days to get back. That seems to be reasonable. At the short end, and this is five days that Paul has nothing to do but sit in Miletus and think about what he's going to say to these people. He believes at this point that he's never going to see them again. So this is kind of his last message to them. What does he want to leave them with? Now, what we know is he is ultimately going to run into these guys again, but he doesn't know that at this point. Um, what is his last words to these people? What would you want to be remembered about you? So here's what it says. When they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came to the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. Now, I just want to stop right there and say there's this weird thing in the American church where if bad things are happening, we feel like God's upset with us. Look at what Paul says. He's faithful in severe testing by the plots of the Jews and with tears. Like this is not, I can't wait to get up and hurt again. Woo! This is not, I, f I found my passion. I'm serving in my giftedness. <laughs> I hate that conversation, by the way. Here's the deal about spiritual gifts. This is bonus material, it's second service. You don't get a gift when you say yes to Jesus and then that never changes and that becomes leverage for you to not have to do certain kinds of ministry. That's not how spiritual gifts work. You're called to be a servant and whatever situation you step into, the Holy Spirit empowers you through his gifting to do what you need to do. So stop saying, no, it's not my gifting. It's not true. Unless your gifting is the gift of selfishness. Probably going to get in trouble for that. <laughs> it's true. Hard truth. Through tears he served the Lord. Not because he loved it. But because it's what he was called to. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus, which raises this incredible question, why then is he going to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost? Another conversation for another day, but if Paul is a Jesus-believing 
Jewish person? Why is he going to celebrate Pentecost? And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. He's like, I'm going right into the mouth of the lion here. Like, this is going to be, this could end badly. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. (laughs) Thanks, Holy Spirit. Like, what if, what if, Holy Spirit, you just moved on the hearts of people to give me favor? What if you did that? Nope, that ain't how it rolls. He comes to Paul and says, hey, these people aren't going to like you. Preach anyway. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, here's what I want you to know. I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Here's what he says. I'm never going to see you again, so I want you to know this. I've held nothing back from you. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought with, bought with his own blood. And I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. That's encouraging. He's like, I know that when I'm gone, there's going to be people that are, and he calls them savage wolves. They're going to come in and try to destroy you. And and you're going to have to figure out how to stay the course, church in Ephesus. Because I'm not going to be here to fight for you. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. So by the way, more bonus material. I'm getting ready to do this turkey trip, and Ephesus is one of the places that we go. So I've been looking at the letter in Revelation to the church in Ephesus. What does does Jesus commend them for? You have tested the prophets and found them to be false, and you have stayed the course. But you lost your first love. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In other words, what he's saying here is you guys know I didn't do this for the money. I would love to put that standard up against some of our famous televangelists in our day. You guys know I didn't do this for the money. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Boo. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed, and they all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was this statement that he would never see him again. And then they accompanied him to the ship. And after we had torn ourselves away from them, I love that statement. We put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos the next day. We went to Rhodes, and from there we went to Patera. Uh, After we had torn ourselves, like one of the things that happens, um, and this happens, it's happened to me, it's happened in me, 
um, and I've seen it happen to other, like when people, when pastors are like, hey, I'm, I'm leaving, what, what happens typically is we emotionally disconnect. Now we do this to protect ourselves, but that's not what we see these people doing. They're like, they're, no. That's how kingdom relationships ought to be. Kingdom relationships ought to be such that when we separate from one another, there's a tearing internally for us. It's hard. It's hard for us to be apart from one another. We should love people that way. That's how we're called to love others. That it should hurt us when we're not together. We work so hard to protect ourselves emotionally. I want to protect myself emotionally. And what we do with that is we distance ourselves in relationship, which is not kingdom. That's not kingdom. In the kingdom, we embrace relationship fully. What do you want to be remembered for? Paul lists some specific things here, and I want to put some thoughts together on what it means from Paul's perspective to finish well. I'm going to give us four lessons that I think Paul communicates here. Um, And then uh, we'll see if there's not some application for you and me. Um, Number one, be someone worth imitating. If you want to finish well, be someone worth imitating. This is what Paul says from the jump. He says, listen, you know how I lived. You know that I didn't take advantage of you. You know that I didn't hesitate to preach the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You know that I didn't hold back. You know that I gave you everything that I had to give you. You know that. You were there. You've seen it. You lived alongside me. It wasn't like I was hiding out somewhere. Be someone worth imitating. What we want to do in our life, in our world, is we want to find people that we can look up to. And I appreciate that. Like, we need people that we can look up to. But there are too few people trying to be someone to look up to. Be someone to look up to. Like, this, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. In other words, imitate me as I imitate Jesus which on the surface feels really arrogant, right? Like, who do you think you are, Polly, Polly, two by four? Like, who do you think you are? Imitate me, because look at me, I'm awesome. This is the fundamental reality of discipleship. Follow my examples. By the way, if you're a parent, you know exactly what this is like, right? If you're a parent, you know that your kids will do what you do, not what you say, And they catch the stuff that you do in the best of moments, right? Like when I'm in the garage working on the car, if there was ever a moment for me to lose my Christianity, like I'm not good at that stuff. I'm not good at, if I can't fix something by speaking at it, it, I can't do it. I can't fix it. I can tell it what to do, but if it's not willing to do it, it's going to stay broken, (laughs) because I can't help it along. Um, And I like home improvement and working, I'm just no good, I'm no good at it. I, I, (laughs) I'm just no good at it. I, I, I hate it, first of all. I don't have the right tools, but even if I had the right tools, I don't know how to use the right tools. And even if I knew how to use the right tools, I would measure twice and cut once and it would still be too short. And the line would not be straight and it wouldn't fit. And I watch guys that are gifted at it, guys, men and women who are gifted at home and like people that cut trim, like the Finnish carpenters that do that stuff. I'm like, they, and they're, they do it so fast and it's perfect. I do it and it looks like somebody without arms did it. <laughs> that's, that's what it looks like. My wife's like, honey, can, what do you think about bringing... And I'm like, no, I can do it. Because it's like personal, right? But then I hate myself for it. Um, and every time somebody comes over, I'm like, yeah, I did that. Let me explain to you why it sucks. Like that. <laughs> so my shame becomes a topic of conversation. I, 
I am no good at working on stuff like that. Home improvement, cars, right? And that's the space where I'm like, <laughs> we're trying to get a wrench and I drop the wrench for the 47th time. So I grab the other thing, whatever it is that's laying there, probably a can of oil, just, ah, throw it, explodes against the wall. And that's when my kids are there. <laughs> and they're like, oh, that's how you work on cars. I didn't know, but now I do. <laughs> this is a fault. You, people will follow your example. Be somebody worth imitating. The, this is discipleship. By the way, we're all called to make disciples. You're called to be a disciple, yes, but you're also called to make disciples. All of us are. That doesn't, you're like, well, I don't know enough. You are making disciples in your life. You are influencing people, but you better do it intentionally. Because if you don't, you'll accidentally create something that you didn't want to. If you want to finish well, be somebody worth imitating. Be, work on being the kind of person that someone can look up to rather than I don't have any models, I don't have any mentors. I can't, I can't grow because I don't have anyone to look up to. Be the person to look up to. Number two lesson on finishing well. A life worth living is defined by what we overcome, not by what's handed to us. L listen, this is the great news. You, as a human, are hardwired for struggle. You're hardwired for it. We need something to overcome. Now, that's different for different people. Like, not everybody wants to be the, I want to overcome starting a company, or I want to overcome inventing this thing, or some people are like, I want to overcome the fashion industry. Great. I, I want to overcome my strong-willed child. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's, there's nothing wrong with any of those things, but we need something to overcome. Here's why. Everybody's chasing happiness in this world. You really don't want happiness. You want purpose. And if you have happiness without purpose, you'll sabotage happiness to create struggle so you can have purpose. There's lots of data to back that up. We sabotage our own happiness when we don't have struggle because we need a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Life that's worth living is defined by what we overcome. That's why Paul is constantly listing all the things that he's overcome because it gave his ministry meaning. By the way, it also gives your message credibility. When you say God is God in my life and all these things that I overcame through his power, I overcame to tell the story of who he is that gives your testimony weight. If you're like, God's God and everything in my life is easy and I just, you know, every time I trip and fall, I make a million dollars and so I trip a lot. Um, like, does it, nobody, people want to punch you if that's your story. They're like, I don't like you. I don't like how easy everything is for you. Think about, um, you've heard the phrase trust fund kids. Right? The, and, and that never comes with anything good. Now, they're not all bad, but um, a lot of them are like the, they, they walked into life where their, their parents were exorbitantly wealthy and their life has just been really, really easy. And they never had to work and they're never going to have to work and they have so much money that no matter what they do, their great-great-grandchildren won't have to work. Right? And, and so now What? They're never taught the value of anything because they don't have to struggle. So what do they do? They make their life an epic train wreck. Why? Because we need struggle. We need it in our life. We need something to overcome. Now here's the thing. If you're like, there's, there's, see, and here's the, here's the, What's interesting about that is there are times where we go, gosh, that struggle's too much. I can't keep fighting this struggle. We all visit in that place, and that's why you need a life group. You're like, I don't, I, I don't, I know I don't want no struggle, but can I have an hour? 
right? Can I get a witness from all the parents and my toddlers, right? I don't need no struggle, but can I have just a little bit of a break? Yeah, because sometimes we, we get to that place where we're like, I can't, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep doing this. I cannot keep doing this. And that's when you need your people to come around you and go, yes, you can, and we're going to do it together. And you're like, who do you think you are? And you're like, I'm the guy that in six months I'm going to need you to say the same thing to me. That's how we live in relationship with one another. That's why life groups are so important. It's not because every week we're like, oh, the, the message changed my life. But it's because eventually, it's true, but it's not why the life groups are important. Um, the, it's because eventually you're going to need people to hold your arms up so that you can keep fighting. And we make provision when we're strong for the times when we're weak. If you don't do that, if you don't intentionally put those relationships in your life when you don't need them, then when you do need them, you won't have them. And that's a problem. Life that's worth living isn't handed to you. And as parents, we do our kids a tremendous disservice when we don't make them work, when we don't make them learn the value of a dollar when we don't make them learn responsibility, when we don't make them learn how to struggle and overcome. You don't do your kids any service when you just hand them everything. And there's too many parents that are like bubble wrapping their children and you're like, hey, he's 30. (laughs) Um, You could cut the bubble wrap off. But I, can't, but I can't let him go. He can't, he can't walk. He's only 30. <laughs> Turn him loose. Let him struggle. Let him fail. It's okay. Now, don't abandon him. Be there to pick him up. But don't do it for him. Romans 8, starting in verse 18. Here's what Paul says. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. No matter what you're going through, it is not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in you one day. For the creation waits an eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For, uh, for creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Right up until the present time, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what we already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. This is a really difficult passage to understand. There's a lot of people who would say that this is a space where um, we see a justification for a prayer language, uh, speaking in tongues in a prayer language. Um, I want to give you at least two other ways to understand that verse. Um, I'm not going to unpack it too far, but I want to give you at least two other ways to understand that verse. One is this. You remember when you were a little kid, or maybe you are a parent right now who's experiencing this, and you say to your child, it's time to go clean your room. And the kid is like, nope. You like, yes, actually, it's time for you to go clean your room. I'm so mad. You can be as mad as you want to while you're in your room cleaning it. Because right? it's time to go clean your room. And the child goes, I hate you. One way to understand this verse is if the Holy Spirit came to the parent and said, hey, um, let me help you understand what they actually meant. Maybe that's how the Holy Spirit interprets our prayers for God the Father. there's There's a filter between the words that we speak in ignorance and the knowledge that he brings. And that, maybe that's that. That's one other option. Another option would be this. I had a cousin that was the same age as me. Babo was his name. And uh, 
He's from Kentucky, so Bobo made total sense. You guys are like, like the clown? No, that's Bobo. <laughs> Not the same. Um, he was driving home one night late. Um, we were about 19 or 20 at the time, and he was drunk, and he got hit by a dump truck and killed. And uh, his mom, when she found out about it, was so overcome with grief, uh, my aunt, that she couldn't speak she could, she only, mo- she groaned. Like there was this deep seated groan of pain. Um, maybe the Holy Spirit makes sense of those spaces. Maybe when we have words that we can't even make words, that the Holy Spirit understands how to filter that into something meaningful. Maybe that's it too. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purpose. Now here's the deal. If you know the verse, Romans 8, 28. Don't you ever Romans 8, 28 somebody? Oh, you're hurting? Romans 8, 28, brother. I'm not saying that if somebody does that to you that you have permission to hit them. <laughs> but I'm not not saying it. <laughs> Here's the thing. It's the most callous thing. When somebody's in a space where they actually need that verse, you know what they don't need? They don't need somebody to quote that verse. They need a hug. They, they need somebody to actually sit and engage and have compassion for them. Let me just put a little bit of boundaries on this. First of all, it does not say that everything is good. It says that all things can work for good, but some things are really bad. Like they're just bad and they're bad, and that's just the way it is. There's no workaround on that. But here's why it can work for good if we'll let it. Here's why. If you keep reading, what it says is that all things work for good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Here's why it's good. Because if you'll let it, really hard things can help a better version of Jesus live in you. You look more like Jesus on the other side of it. To be pithy, you can get bitter or you can get better. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Here's why this matters. Because when you're in the, in the pit of despair, that when you're in the mess and the bottom of the bottom of the bottom and you're crying out to the Lord, the number one thing that we have a tendency to think is that God's holding out on us in some way. And what he says is, listen, when you find yourself in that space, it can work for good. And never forget this, he didn't even spare his own son. So I can promise you if he doesn't do that, he's not going to hold out on you. He's not holding out on you. Now that doesn't answer the question why, but it gives us the strength to take another step. God's not holding out on us. Who will bring any charge against those whom God's chosen? It's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long and we're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're, we're more than conquerors in all these hard things through Christ. 
We're not being abandoned by the love of Christ. We're empowered to get through those things. Listen, whether or not you stay close to Jesus, you will have difficult things in your life. But at least if you're walking close to Jesus, your difficult things have a purpose. If you're not walking close to Jesus, there's no reason to endure. Your life is not worth living if it's just handed to you. A life that's worth something is defined by what we overcome. And that means we've got to step into it. Don't be like, I feel bad. Run away, run away, run away. No. You'll never conquer it when you let it control you. Like, no, I, I, yes, I feel this way. Yes, this is how it is. Yes, this is true. And no, I will not let it control me. Third lesson. The only thing that we take with us is, is the relationships we build on the way. The only thing that you're going to take with you into heaven is the relationships that you build along the way. My dad used to say this all the time. I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. And I've heard of people that are so attached to their things, like they get buried in their Cadillac or whatever. Um, the, the only thing that we will take with us into the next life is the relationships that we build along the way. You're never going to stand before God and be like, hey, look at my bank account. Gotta be like, that's, that's really amazing. Um, my streets are gold. So top that. Like, the only thing that we can take with us is the people that we've loved well along the way. First Thessalonians 2, Paul says this, but brothers and sisters, we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time in person, but not in thought. Out of our intense longing, we made every effort to come see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or our crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. The only thing that means anything in this life is the relationships that we build that we can take with us into the next. And culture tells us to chase every other thing so that it's, we're too busy to focus on the most important thing. Lesson number four. The last 10% matters the most. My friend Brad told me this story about a, a, a married couple that he met. And what they do is they're artists and, and they go around the world. They're sculptors and painters. And what they do is they go around the world and they find uh, rundown parks and governments will actually pay them to uh, come in and kind of spruce up the park. And so they do murals and sculptures and that kind of stuff and beautify the park. And so they do this and they make a living at it. And they also teach art on the side. And this gal that, that they were visiting and this gal told Brad this story. And I was like, gosh, it's so good. Um, so I'm stealing it. Uh, here's what she says. When you're doing an art project, the last 10% matters the most. She said, you can do the first 10% pristinely and then you can be mediocre in the last 10% and it will destroy the whole project conversely you can be really mediocre at the first 90% but if you finish the last 10% well then the whole thing becomes beautiful the last 10% matters the most listen in your life the last 10% matters the most the last 10% matters the most. And that's really good news for you and me because we have a tendency to not finish well. I, I see this happen a lot in churches. Not everybody, but a lot of people, they're like, well, I did my time. I served my sentence of ministry. Uh, I, I did my years of blah, blah, blah. The last 10% matters the most. See, here's the thing. What I find in churches is that as people walk with the Lord longer and longer and longer, they don't love Jesus as much as they did when they started. 
They figure out the rules and the system and the culture, and they figure out how to live within that, but they don't love Jesus as much as they used to. The last 10% matters the most. I watch pastors do this, where they get into ministry and they're all wide-eyed and idealized about the, the church and the Bible and God. And it's like, man, when you come to church, when you come to work at the church, you just pray all day and sing worship songs. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Turns out there's an actual organization to run. Um, but that they, they, have, they have these weird misconceptions about what the church is and, and, and then they get into the church and they find out that, doggone it, pastors are people and they make mistakes and they, they do dumb things and they say dumb things and sometimes they make mistakes that are really big and it's painful and you gotta figure out how to navigate all that and, and, and little by little by little it starts to erode your ability to love God well. Uh, A.W. Tozer says it this way. I'm going to paraphrase what he said. When God's presence shows up in a church, people are drawn to it. And the church grows because of God's presence. What's interesting about that, side note, is that the books that are written aren't about how to foster God's presence because that's actually really boring. What's written about is the unique ministry strategy that we came up with. Here's the deal. You could put God's presence in the middle of a library and people will show up. What does happen, though, the reality is that you do have to have some kind of structure. Like people come, you got to have some kind of way to manage them or it's chaos. That's just true. But then the danger is that we lose the, the focus on the presence of God and we start focusing on the system that we believe opened us up to God's presence rather than the other way around. And what Tozer says is the Holy Spirit leaves and the church is left pulling the lever of the system long after the Holy Spirit has left. Listen, I, I want to be like Enoch. What the, what the Bible says is Enoch walked with God and then he was no more. It's like he was so close to God in his relationship that God was like, okay, this is just silly. Just come up here. <laughs> this is, you're so, we're so tight anyway. Let's, let's just see each other face to face. I want to be like that. I want Jesus to take, you'd be like, you, you'll come to church and you'd be like, where's Aaron? He walked with God and then was no more, right? Or he crossed his wife the wrong way one too many times. <laughs> and that's far more likely the story. <laughs> uh, but it, like, I want to be like, it doesn't matter how we start. I, I want to love Jesus more when I'm 65 than I did when I was 25. Uh, I don't really want to live past 65. I want to die young and on with my hair on fire. Um, but too many of us settle into like pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back. To those of you that consider yourself, I'll let you be the judge of whether or not you fit this criteria to be in the last 10% of your life. And we don't know, right, how long we have. We don't know. But let's assume that you consider yourself to be in that space. The, the kingdom needs you. Like, we, we need you. Not to control us and tell us what to do, but there's a lot of us who grew up in homes where we didn't have good models of parents. And we don't, and we're trying to figure out how to raise a family and we don't know how to do it. Or, or you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of us that are in the workforce that don't know what it means to be an ethical business person. And we need people that are willing to step into that space with us. 2 Timothy 4, here's what Paul says. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith.
Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I want, we've got to finish well. It's the last 10%. It, starting out idealized and then being jaded is not Holy spirit at all. What it means is we start letting our flesh move in and take over. Jadedness, the cynicism, that's not from the spirit. That's from my flesh. And it comes from real hurts and real wounds that we got to really work through. But the Holy Spirit brings connection and a belief in something being better. Some implications for us as we tie this down. Number one, our legacy is the people we've made better along the way. Don't ever forget that. Your legacy is not your retirement. It's not your house. It's not any possession that you could have or some status that you can reach in your job. Your legacy is the people you've made better along the way. Implication number two. When we're working to overcome life's struggles, we have a life worth living. Celebrate your struggles, don't whine. Dance at the opportunity for God to show you something new. And I'm not minimizing your struggles, they're real and they're hard. Keep fighting. Implication number three, character matters. People remember who you are, not what you say. This is true. People remember who you are, not what you say. Okay. Implication number four. The last 10% of your life is more important than the first 90. Which for you and me who, who have maybe not lived in that first 90% as we've wanted to, that gives us hope. Like the idea would be that we just ramp up, ramp up, ramp up, ramp up, more intensity, that we would have more spiritual fervor serving the Lord at 90 than we did at 20. That we wouldn't settle in, step back, get apathetic, hand off, disregard, but that we would engage and have a fire in our bellies. <laughs> I can tell you a funny story. Uh, uh, you know, you guys know Russ. Maybe you've heard of him, Russ McCracken founder of the church. He came in the office um, uh, whenever the, was the last time that I was in the office. Um, it's been a minute. I've been out gallivanting. Um, I, I was, he always swings by, you know, to encourage me. Love that guy. And I said, Russ, how are you doing? He goes, I'm bored. I'm going to go call on people. He's going to the hospital to pray with people. It's like, I'm bored. I'm going to pray with people. I just love that. I just love that. Like that's the, his passion for people and for the Lord has increased. It's not settled. It's not gone away. It's increased. I keep telling him, I'm like, look, Russ, come back to work. He's like, oh no, you guys don't want me around. Russ, we, we need you. We need your heart infused into the DNA of this church still, right? It's that heart that God blessed. The last 10% of your life is more important than the first 90. I would just ask you to consider as we move towards communion, it's so easy to get distracted by so many things and to settle back and to not really stay focused and intense, to keep our spiritual fervor serving the Lord, like Romans 12 says. What's getting in the way? Where is your distraction? And, and maybe what would God want you to do with that? Let's talk with him about that as we prepare our hearts for communion. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body which is given for you. So whenever you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. Let's remember him. Okay. 
And then after the dinner, he took a cup and he said, this cup, this is the blood of the covenant which is shed for you. So whenever you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your grace and thank you for purpose. God, help us to be people who finish well. Help us to be people who stand in the space of mission and don't ever grow weary in doing good. God, help us to be people who represent you well. In Jesus' name, amen.